Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the Software Carpentry Lecture on Regular Expressions. In this episode, we'll have a look at a few more patterns you can use to build up regular expressions. If you recall, we're trying to parse data from notebooks, recording background evil levels in millivators at several sites in the Shire a couple of years after the explosion of the Death Star. These records are in different formats, and a couple of episodes ago, we managed to build this function to extract the dates from those records. Inside this function, we're applying a regular expression to the record. If it matches, we're returning the matched groups, reordering them if necessary so that we always get back year, month, and day. This version of the function does a better job of pulling data out of our records. First, it gets the site and reading as well as the year, month, and day. Second, and more importantly, this function is more declarative. The variable patterns stores one entry for each format of record we think we have to parse. The first element of each entry is a regular expression to match data in that format. The remaining fields in the entry are a permutation of the indices of the groups in that pattern. In our loop, we pull the pattern and the indices for the year, month, day, site, and reading out of each entry in the table in turn. If the pattern matches, we then return the matched groups, permuting them according to the indices so that the data always comes back in the same order, year, month, day, site, and reading. Why is this better? Well, every time we have another data format to match, all we have to do is add one more entry. This makes this function very easy to extend and very easy to test. So let's take a look at notebook number three. It has the date as three fields, the site name in parentheses, and then the reading. We know how to parse dates in this format. The fields are separated by spaces. But how do we match against those parentheses? So far, when we've seen parentheses in a regular expression, they haven't matched characters. They've created groups. The way we solve this problem, i.e. the way we match a literal open parenthesis or closed parenthesis using a regular expression, is to put backslash open parenthesis or backslash close parenthesis in the RE. This is another example of an escape sequence, just as we use the two character sequence backslash T in a string to represent a literal tab character, we use the two character sequence backslash open parenthesis or backslash close parenthesis in a regular expression to represent the literal character open parenthesis or close parenthesis. However, in order to get that backslash into the string, we have to escape it by doubling it up. So the string representation of the regular expression that matches an opening parenthesis is actually backslash backslash open parenthesis. This might be confusing, so let's take a look at how the various layers work. Our program text, i.e. what's stored in our .python file, looks like this. And here we have two backslashes, an open parenthesis, two backslashes, and a closed parenthesis inside quotes. When Python reads that file in, it turns the two character sequence backslash backslash into a single literal backslash character in the string in memory. That's the first level of escaping. When we hand the string backslash open parenthesis, backslash close parenthesis to the regular expression library, it takes the two character sequence backslash open parenthesis and turns it into an arc in the finite state machine that matches a literal parenthesis. Turning this over, if we want a literal parenthesis to be matched, we have to give the regular expression library backslash parenthesis if we want to put backslash parenthesis in a string, we have to write it in our .python file as backslash backslash parenthesis. With that out of the way, let's go back to notebook number three. The regular expression that will extract the five fields from each record looks like this. A word beginning with an uppercase character followed by one or more lowercase characters, a space, one or two digits, another space, four digits, another space, some stuff involving backslashes and parentheses, another space, 
and then one or more characters, which is the reading. If we take a closer look at that stuff, double backslash open parenthesis and double backslash close parenthesis are how we write the regular expressions that match a literal open parenthesis or close parenthesis character in our data. The two inner parentheses that don't have backslashes in front of them create a group but don't match any literal characters and we create that group so that we can save the results of the match, in this case the name of the site. Now that we know how to work with backslashes in regular expressions, we can take a look at some character sets that come up frequently enough to deserve their own abbreviations. If you use backslash D in a regular expression, it matches the digits 0 through 9. If you use backslash S, it matches the white space characters, space, tab, carriage return, and new line. And backslash W matches word characters. It's equivalent to the set shown on the right of uppercase letters, lowercase letters, digits, and the underscore. This might seem a funny definition of word. It's actually the set of characters that can appear in a variable name in a programming language like C or Python. And again, in order to write one of these regular expressions as a string in Python, you have to double up the backslashes. Now that we've seen these character sets, we can take a look at an example of really bad design. Backslash s means non-space characters, i.e. everything that isn't a space tab carriage return a new line. That might seem to contradict what I said a few seconds ago, but that's an uppercase s, not a lowercase s. Similarly, and unfortunately, backslash w means non-word characters, provided it's an uppercase w. Upper and lowercase s and w look very similar, particularly when there aren't other characters right next to them to give context. This means that these sequences are very easy to mistype and what's worse, even easier to misread. Everyone eventually uses an uppercase s when they meant to use a lowercase s or vice versa and then wastes a few hours trying to track it down. So please, if you're ever designing a library that's likely to be widely used, try to choose notation that doesn't make mistakes this easy. Along with the abbreviations for character sets, the regular expression library recognizes a few shortcuts that match things that aren't actual characters. For example, if you put a circumflex at the start of a pattern, it matches the beginning of the input text. So the pattern circumflex mask will match the text mask size because the letters M-A-S-K come at the start of the string, but that same pattern will not match the word unmask going to the other end. If dollar sign is the last character in the pattern, it matches the end of the input text rather than a literal dollar sign. So T-E-M-P dollar sign will match the string high temp, but it won't match the string temperature. A third shortcut that's often useful is backslash B, often called break. It matches the boundary between word and non-word characters. It doesn't actually match any characters. It doesn't consume any input. But it matches the transition between non-word characters and letters, digits, and the underscore. If we have break, age, break, it will match the string the age of because there's a non-word character right before the A and another non-word character right after the E. That same pattern will not match the word phage because there isn't a transition from non-word to word characters or vice versa right before the A. We've now seen about a dozen of the atoms that are used to build regular expressions. There are many more and every language or library adds a few of its own. In the next episode we'll take a closer look at the functions in the regular expression library that are used to apply these to problems.